Well, hey, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. I uh, want to thank you for coming to our live show, Dog Wellness Re Revelations. And um, without any further ado, because we're a bit uh, we're starting just a bit uh, late, I want to apologize for that and thank you for staying with us and thanks for being on live with us. I want to remind you before we go live uh, with the show, that you can ask your questions down below um, in the comments field on YouTube and Facebook. So right in there under the comments, under where you're watching, you can submit your questions. And if we have time, we'll get to them uh, right on the show. So without further ado, let me introduce my wonderful co-host and uh, compatriot here at Gussie's Gut, Dr. Ian Billinghurst. Good morning, everybody, or good evening, and basically, hello, and morning, Rob. Good morning to you. Good morning. Well, let's get our guest on, shall we, Dr. B? Let's do that. All right, great. Well, we're so excited. Um, I, I'm I, I'm so pleasantly surprised whenever I meet somebody in a busy business that is uh, lovely to chat with and interact with, and... Uh, so I have such a person that we are going to have on the show today. She is one of the co-founders of WeFeedRaw.com, and they make an amazing product, and we want to talk about that product and their origin story. So Amy Zalnarikis is here on the show with us today. Hi, Amy. Nice to see you. You almost got my last name right. Amy but... Zalnarikis. I know. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm not reading it. Amy Zalnarikis. Right, it it's okay. It sounds like, it's like, sounds like a disease. My sister used to say it was... Called, you know, inflammation of the Zalmer. <laughs> but it's very hard to pronounce. So, you know, you're not the only one who's uh, not pronounced it correctly. Well, I just, I mean, I just proved that I'm not reading anything. So I guess there's, you know, that's what you get for being live, everybody. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Amy Zalneratus. 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 Like, thank you, Amy. I guess, yep. Yes, thank you. <laughs> good, good, good morning, Amy. And I'll stick with Amy. <laughs> yeah, you can stick with Amy. Much easier. My parents were uh, nice and giving me a short first name. Well, we're very excited to have you. And uh, we, you know, we've done some homework on your company and that's the reason we invited you. We're, we're thrilled to find these great companies that have such high quality um, in a very difficult space. It's a difficult business yeah. to be in, um, you know, creating safe, healthy, raw food. So, what I thought would be really interesting, and I know Dr. B is going to be very interested in this story. He and I haven't talked about this, but let's talk about a little bit about how WeFeedRaw.com came to be, your, your origin story. Sure. Um, I'm so happy to be here today. And again, Dr. Billinghurst, it's just an honor to meet you. Uh, I, your book, Give Your Dog a Bone, was one of, if not the first books I read on raw feeding. I think uh, most raw feeders or people in this business that have it on their bookshelf. So um, you are just such a pioneer in this field and you've done so much for the movement. So um, we're, we're all indebted to you. <laughs> it's, it's not an easy business, but uh, you've made it somewhat easier, <laughs> paved the way. Um, so We Feed Raw uh, was actually founded by my sister, Alyssa. Alyssa was a devout dog lover from childhood. Uh, we were raised by parents who were always rescuing animals. So um, treating animals well was not only instilled in us from a young age, uh, it's also, I think, part of our DNA. So my sister grew up to be a big rescuer of dogs herself. Uh, at one point, I think she had 10 rescues. So we called her house home to the world's friendliest wolf pack. Um, and so she uh, just, you know, started researching raw feeding and became a DIY raw feeder and um, immediately saw the benefits of switching her dogs, her rescues from a highly processed kibble diet to a biologically appropriate raw one. And once she really got, you know, making the meals down, um, she started making um, meals for her friends' dogs and then friends of friends' dogs. And the business just grew organically from there. Um, uh, her fiance, this is around 2009, and Alyssa's fiance, Rich, uh, was also a co-founder. He was a former chef, so he was really good at make, making the actual food and, you know, sourcing the ingredients. And my sister kind of handled the business side of things, and together they were this really awesome team. And they delivered uh, fresh, raw meals door-to-door <laughs> -door in Austin, Texas, where they live. And they had this really nice growing business for um, about four years. It, 
And in 2013, um, the business was still small, but it was doing really well. Um, but at the same time, my sister was given a shocking diagnosis, which was uh, stage four terminal cancer at 35 years old. So this was obviously gutting news to all of us and my family and I rallied together to move Alyssa, the business, Rich and all the dogs uh, to Maine to be closer to us because we were all on the East Coast at the time. Um, so at that point, the, the company transitioned from this small, you know, Austin business to um, a company that was now manufacturing in Maine and shipping nationwide. So that move in and of itself, as you can imagine, helped to, to grow the company exponentially. You know, they're that now have a much big customer, base, bigger customer base. Um, so on December 23rd of 2014, uh, a little over a year after Alyssa's diagnosis, she passed away um, after an incredibly brave fight. Uh, her, her love for dogs and her passion for this business never wavered. Uh, she worked on this business up until the last week of her life, um, you know, until she physically could not anymore. So immediately after her death, despite being in the most acute stages of grief, my family and I came together again to keep the business alive because it was my sister's vision and it was, you know, her legacy and we just knew we couldn't let it die. So there was really no pause in the business. You know, people were relying on this food for their dogs. Um, shipments had to go out, orders had to be processed. So um, my dad, Bruce, came out of retirement to run operations and financials. Rich, Alyssa's fiance, uh, continued to run production, manage a crew, work a very labor intensive schedule, getting up at four in the morning, still making the food, packing the boxes. And I, um, really focused on developing the brand, growing the business and securing outside funding while also simultaneously working a full-time job in New York City. <laughs> so um, we ran this business like this for quite some time, my dad and Rich really holding down the fort um, and me um, back in New York City, developing the brand, um, the customer experience, growing the customer base. Um, at this time, most notably, I also spearheaded a rebrand of the company. So up until this point, it, we'd always been seen as just like a supplier of raw. We were never really a brand. And I really thought, you know, my background is in creative. I'm a creative and I've worked in marketing and branding. I really thought we needed a cohesive brand to, you know, convey our philosophy and our values and to also reflect the, the amazingness of our product, you know. Um, so in March of 2018, we completed that rebrand and to this day after our product, I have to say it's one of our biggest assets. Um, it's, there's not a lot of great branding <laughs> in pet food. <laughs> it's getting better, uh, but it's especially in raw pet food. So I think that we have this modern, fresh, clever, smart brand that, that resonates with the millennial demographic, um, not just them, but particularly them. And they happen to be the largest pet owning demographic. So it's worked out pretty well for us. It's also, you know, given us credibility in the marketplace, which has helped to, you know, for us to expand. Um, in 2019, my husband Chauncey came on to run operations and financials so that my dad could finally retire. So we kept, continued to keep it in the family. <laughs> um, we also brought on a PhD nutritionist. Uh, partnered with a co-packer and an HPP facility. And last year in 2021, we completed another capital raise, which has helped us grow uh, more than we've ever grown. Um, so just to give you an idea, in 2021, we delivered uh, around 624,000 pounds of food and we expect to deliver 1 million in 2022. So that brings us to today, where we're currently in the process of expanding to multiple facilities around the country. Um, and this move, by increasing our distribution network, uh, we're able to service 98% of the contiguous U.S. with one and two day transit times. Um, so this means faster time to the customer. We can really hone in on the frequency of the food so that customers always have the right amount of food. Um, you know, we can get into this, but we're a meal kit delivery service. So, you know, everything is uh, customized for the dogs so that, you know, they're feeding you know, once you run out of food from the previous box, the other box shows up just in time. And that's where we are today. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow, indeed. <laughs> I, I just love the fact that you've grown 
from a small family business and it's grown organically. Yeah. I think that is so brilliant. Yeah. You haven't tried to be big. You weren't, all you were doing was setting out to do something good. And from that, something good grew. Uh, I mean, I, my heart just sinks for your sister. That's just, and for your, for you all and, and your sister. Yeah. But um, somehow out of that grief and tragedy has sprung this wonderful company. So congratulations from, from me very deeply and sincerely. Thank you. And I, I do think that it's been cathartic for us all as a family to have this, to, to you know, in, in a lot of ways it is her, you know, continuing on. And, you know, I feel her around all the time. And I, I know that she would be completely proud of where the company is today. Um, you know, this, like you were saying, Dr. Billinghurst, this was born out of, I mean, a dedication to the well-being of animals and the desire to feed those animals the healthiest diet possible. That's it. It wasn't like a get rich quick, you know, how to like, uh, you know, go to business school and figure out like, oh, pet foods, uh, you know, lucrative. It was it was born out of just wanting to treat animals well and feed them, feed them well. So I think that's carried us through. And I think that comes through to the customer. And um, that's why we've been able to be successful and will continue to be successful. Yeah. Well, you, you're uh, certainly... Yeah. I was just going to say, you're certainly not getting rich quick in the raw food business. No, no. and it's not for the faint of heart. It is hard. No. Yeah, yeah. I mean, shipping well, raw. I'm, food I'm really food. loving the fact that you've um, dispersed your business around the country because that means, and I'm, I'm just making an assumption here, that you're sourcing local to, yes. to feed local. Yes, yeah, so everything is sourced in the USA from farms we trust. Um, we do source our lamb and venison from New Zealand, um, all grass-fed, pasture-raised, very high quality, human grade. Um, but yeah, besides the lamb and venison, everything is sourced in the USA. Um, we manufacture our food out of the middle of the country, um, and then we will ship it to these distribution, the fulfillment centers, um, around the country so that you know just it's tough now because we still have three-day transit times right which is fine in the winter but when you get to these hotter ones it's like if you don't get it there like right on that third day if it's even like five hours later you can have like thawed packages so it's it's tricky um it's really tricky i love the fact you've got lamb and venison from new zealand because that is such a beautiful clean green country yes and the, their produce is just absolutely brilliant um yes. probably one of those little gems in the world new zealand yes i know yeah <laughs> yeah we really pride ourselves on the quality of our food um it's always been and will continue to be um our top priority along with safety um so yes uh we, i don't know if we talked about this rob in the past but when we first um spoke but our recipes are, I guess, inspired by, based on the prey model raw diet. So we don't have the actual like bones on the side of the prey, but it's 80%, approximately 80% meaty meat, as the raw vegan world calls it, which is muscle meat and connective tissue and fat, 10% organ meat, all of, which, all of which is secreting organ, half of which is liver, and then 10% fresh finely ground bone. We do add a uh, high quality vitamin and mineral mix for full and proper nutrition, but it's a very small amount because all of those micronutrients occur naturally in our formulas. So, um, you know, to say complete and balanced per AFCO standards, we, you know, are being compliant, but yeah, we're very proud of the product that we create and um, the safety program we have in place. Um, so, yeah. So do you make live stage formulas, Amy? I wasn't quite sure from your website just exactly how it functioned, but um, do you make live stage formulas or is it sort of one basic formula? How do, how do you work this? So our formula, we've worked with a PhD nutritionist to ensure that um, this is complete and balanced for all life stages, including the growth of large breed puppies, 70 pounds or more, uh, fully grown. So yeah, it's for, we don't do specific puppy formulas, or adult formula, they're all for all life stages. And can you tell me about um, the sort of things that people tell you about your product? Because you must get people contacting you and talking to you about your product. 
I mean, one of our big, I would say another big, um, you know, asset is our customer service is, is top notch. And um, it always has been, we're very um, hands on with our customers, whether, you know, they want to chat us, text us, call us, email us, we're really trying to make ourselves available to them, especially during the transition phase to raw, because um, you know, I think people start out feeding raw from a place of fear, uh, you know, because of veterinarians and because of what they hear, there's just like so much fear mongering around raw. So it's tough when, um, people don't have the tolerance for the transition because it's like, you know, I always compare it to like a human switching from eating a highly processed, like, you know, junk food diet. And then you start eating like whole foods you're going to understand that, you know, you might have some digestive upset for a few days, right? But for some reason, it's not applied to, do it's like, they have, they're having loose stools or like, you know, they're, you know, constipated or, you know, it's like there's, and then immediately there must be something wrong with the food. And of course, if they take the dog to the vet when they're having these symptoms and the vet isn't pro-raw, which we know often happens, um, they just get scared off. So there's still a lot of education that needs to happen um, with the transition process. Um, but most of the time, to get back to your question on what people say about our food, uh, it's overwhelmingly positive. Um, people cannot believe what a biologically appropriate diet can do to a dog's quality of life. I mean, it's, it's and I think why the raw feeding movement has grown so much by word of mouth is because it's like so awesome when you see it happen that you just want to share it with other people. It's like you want to tell your brother, you want to go to the dog park and talk to other people and be like, you have to try this. It's amazing. Like, um, you know, my dog doesn't have allergies anymore or they've, you know, slimmed down to their ideal weight or, you know, their digestion is so much better. So, it's, it's really a cool thing to see happen. And I think that people love to share that. What, what do you have any, you, you're talking there about um, health problems. Do they talk about things like arthritis, um, diabetes, even cancer to you? Yes. Um, we, you know, have to be careful when people come to us with specific health conditions. We have to be careful that we're not vets and we can't provide, you know, medical advice. But what we can tell you anecdotally, anecdotally is this is what we've seen. And this is how we've seen it. You know, we, we encourage you to try it for yourself. Um, and most of them do. And most of them see an amazing result. It's like if you're <laughs> dog is overweight and suffering from diabetes because they're eating, you know, a carb heavy starch laden, you know, diet that they're not meant to digest. And then they, you switch them to something they are not designed to eat. The results are remarkable, you know? So, um, but I think that the challenge for most raw companies is, is the education factor and just the fear factor and, and getting people um, over that hump. I think once they, it's like after the first week of feeding, um, when they start to see the benefits, it's like, okay, smooth sailing. But it's really that first, like getting people to trust, like, are you sure raw food isn't going to hurt my dog? And like, you know, there's a, a lot of fear around raw meat <laughs> and salmonella. And so um, I think it's just getting them over that hump that is, is a big obstacle. What, what's your advice during the transition period? So we have a trans. So when someone signs up a new customer, whether they're on raw or not, because you know all raw formulas are different. We don't put fruits or veggies in our formula. A lot of people add them on their own, and we totally support it. We think it's amazing. Um, but it's complete and balanced as is, so you don't have to add those things. But um, we just basically um, um, tell them, you know, like if they want to add fruits or veggies, like go ahead and do that. Um, if what was the question? Sorry. <laughs> well, just what do you have any particular advice to people when they are transitioning? Just any okay. little aids or tips yes. that might help them through this period? Yes, sorry. Um, so we trans we, we tell them to transition over 10 days and they're sent a box with a transition um, with instructions on how to transition. And it includes like basically the the, the basis of it is like feed 25%. 50%, 75%, 100%. By day 10, you should be feeding 100% raw. 
So it's a slow introduction to slowish introduction. Some dogs might need a longer transition. Some dogs, you know, you guys probably know that some dogs would do fine on a cold turkey switch, right? Some dogs might not need that, but most dogs will. And I think a lot of times um, it's more for the pet owner because they'll, you know, it, there's less symptoms. Um, the dog might be fine with having some loose stools. The dog might be fine with having a little constipation, but it's the owner that gets freaked out. So I think the transition is really for the owner too. <laughs> I mean, of course, we don't want the dog in any sort of discomfort, but um, the transition is really for 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 the owner too. Absolutely, Rob. Would you like to comment a little bit more on that transition period? Because I know you've had a bit of experience in that area. Sure. I mean, you know, it, you know, Amy's right on. I mean, it's uh, you know, it's there's a richness to raw food if you you can just simple oversimplify it there's a richness that you don't have when a dog is used to kibble uh let's just say kibble diets or, or even cooked diets and so when they get something raw it's like you know um you know when when we maybe eat something that's a dessert that's rich or you know little a little too much indulgence in pastries or something people get that too so it's nothing to be feared and it's very temporary Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, but I, I, I appreciate, you know, how you're, you're like titrating people onto mm -hmm. the, onto the diets. I think that's smart. And, you know, nobody wants to have any accidents in their home, uh, mm -hmm. or, you know, really just see their dog going through it. They, you know, they feel like their dog's in distress, but the truth is that it's super temporary and it's very common. And Dr. B talks all the time about, you know, it's really nothing to be feared or worried about. Yeah. And we do tell them to, we offer, you know, whether it's plain canned organic pumpkin with nothing added, that can be helpful. I mean, even a, a Gussie's Gut product, uh, a good probiotic, we do recommend those things um, as additions to help. Um, and, it's, you know, every dog is different too. Again, some dogs will just do totally fine in the transition and some dogs have, need a little bit more uh, TLC. Um, so we're, we're there to help people with that. And that's something that we will continue to improve on as a company is how do we help people in that transition phase um, be prepared for it going in and then in, during it, like be there for them. So, you know, having raw feeding experts that they can call at our company and talk them through <laughs> some of the issues. Because sometimes if you just get a, you know, piece of paper with instructions on like what to expect, it, it doesn't have the same... Um, you know, feel as like actually talking to someone on, a, on the phone and being like, listen, this is normal. Like, this is what's happened. This has even happened to my own dog. So we're really trying to uh, build a team that will be able to do that for our customers. In, in my early days in the U.S. Um, doing, do, doing lectures to people, um, I met a lot of people who were raw feeders and, and they would talk about something that we can't get in Australia, which was... Um, green tripe and they said uh, and this was true of the english people too they could get hold of green tripe and they added that and this made a big difference because yeah. uh, and perhaps we didn't understand fully back then just the importance of the microbiome mm -hmm. but we knew the dogs that ate that would very quickly adjust and what we're seeing we're seeing of course yeah. was an adjustment to their microbiome and that was brilliant yeah. um so w actually that was one of the reasons i became involved with uh, Rob because he was producing a product that um, tampered with, the, <laughs> if I can use that word, <laughs> tampered or messed around with the microbiome in a very positive way. And uh, I got enthusiastic for that because it's, it's a big part of raw feeding. Of course, when you feed raw, you produce, um, you're, you're actually going to change the microbiome. And if we can speed that up some way, and this was what Rob was producing, a product that would speed up this change with fermented veggies, I got quite excited. But I just thought that was a, a, a that's a very interesting thing, this this major problem that people ha uh, have with swapping to raw, the fear, and fear is a big component, and that fear is compounded, of course, when their dog has digestive issues. Yeah. So um, anything we can do uh, to eliminate that. And yeah. sometimes I've found in my experience that when you combine, say, dry food with raw food, you're really confusing the digestive system, particularly the stomach, and how it wants to deal with it. I've found for the vast majority of dogs will do better 
if we go bang straight into raw, but occasionally that doesn't work. Yeah. But if you can actually add some fermented food, yeah. that makes a big difference. Yeah. What do you think, Rob? Yeah, and, and you know, the other thing I think, you, we've covered a bunch of really good points here. Uh, you don't have to feed as much raw food as you do kibble. Um, any food that, whether it's kibble or otherwise, any food that's, that has a bunch of, of additives, whether it's corn or you name it, you know, any fillers and, and all of that, raw food is more nutrient dense so you can, you get to feed less of it. And the other thing that I think is so cool, you know, when I met Ian, it's going on 23 years ago, Ian was still in his practice and he was doing uh, consultations mm -hmm. and I had my first puppy and uh, as an adult and I was just, you know, I, I wanted to learn from the best and figure out how to do this raw food thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just remember I went to the grocery store and I was buying whole turkeys and I was trying to find gizzards and, you know, turkey hearts. And I was trying to match, you know, oh, my gosh, this store doesn't have turkey hearts. Where am I going to get them? The right. organ meat was such a pain. Yeah. You know, yeah. so to get this organ meat from a company like yours, a company yeah. that, you know, puts it all together, it's so much easier and <laughs> so much easier than when I, what I was, when I was starting and frankly up to the last five years, yeah. um, you know, um, I, I just think it's great because people are now able to get much more of a balanced meal with, you know, the, the, and the ground bone is also amazing too, you know, yeah. to be able to put that in the food. So. Yeah. yeah. I think that's, I mean, that's one of the philosophy of leafy raw is, is raw feeding made easy. It's like, you know, it can, for the raw curious customer, it can feel like this massive undertaking and we work to make it as easy as possible. We plan, we portion, we package, we deliver. All, all they do is thaw and feed. And, you know, I know this isn't to say <clears throat> you shouldn't try DIY raw feeding. I mean, we sometimes will see on our social ads, you know, this is much more expensive than like what I do myself, but we're like, but we're also providing a service that takes a lot of labor. But, you know, a lot of people don't want to make raw themselves. You know, like they may, they don't have the interest, the time, the resources, the space. So, I mean, we really want to, and all power to the people that are, you know, doing it themselves and love doing it, but there's plenty of people that don't. So we want to be an accessible option to them. I mean, I lived in New York City for 18 years. There's no way that I was going to be going to like the butcher over here to get, and then to like go home and meal prep in my tiny apartment. Like they're just, so we really want to make raw feeding accessible to a larger group of people that, you know, just want the convenience of it. They, they, they don't have any interest in learning how to make complete and balanced raw meals themselves. They just want the assurance that it's done for them and it shows up at their door and they're feeding their dog correctly. Yeah, that's fulfilling a huge um, need out there, Amy. The fact that because dry food made feeding convenient. And convenience is the big thing. So if you can provide a food that is convenient, that it just arrives and all they've got to do is feed it, yes. that is absolutely brilliant. And you're right, there are some people who absolutely want to make it. I happen to be one of them because I'm still making my own yeah. well, <laughs> food for my dog. He grinds it and everything. Wow, you grind it? I grind it. I, I've got a commercial grinder. And I've yes. only got one dog and one cat these days, but... Um, it's it's a point of pride, I guess, and also I can mess around and and, and experiment yeah. as uh, being being an um, inveterate experimenter. Right. My wife hates it when I do that with the cooking for home, but it's, <laughs> it's okay for the dog. Yeah. Well, but, the, yeah. But yeah. you are feeding, uh, you are providing a brilliant service, and right across the country, which is fabulous. Yeah, yeah, it's great, and I think it's really what we've noticed is. Um, you know, when my sister first started this company, she was really operating within a hardcore raw feeding movement, right? 2009, I don't want to say that people who are feeding raw were on the margins of society, but they kind of were, you know? I mean, no, and we're so grateful for them. Those are the people that thought outside the box that were like, you know what? No, I'm not going to listen to like what this vet is telling me is the only way to feed. Something isn't sitting right with me, like that feeding my dog was dry food with a shelf life of like you know five years like so those people were the first customers of this company um 
but that hardcore, you know, mentality also, um, you know, sort of this business started out as like with a very sort of severe draconian uh, way of approaching raw feeding, which is like, if you don't feed 100% raw, like don't bother at all. And there's like nothing. And we've definitely softened our approach because it's like, you're not going to get raw into as many dog bowls with that approach, right? People have different needs. Some people can't afford to feed 100% raw. Some people don't want to feed 100% raw. So we've really softened our approach and, you know, tried to open it up to people, different people's budgets and lifestyles. So we have meal plans you can sign up for, you know, to feed 25% raw, 50% raw, 75% raw, 100% raw. As long as, you know, we're getting raw, some fresh raw into dog bowls, you know, we're happy. We're, we're, we're achieving our goal. Of course, we think 100% raw is the best way. But again, that's just not going to get raw into as many dog bowls as possible. So what, what would you say the percentage of customers that you have um, are coming to you with issues? So their dog is, let's just say sick. Yeah. And um, they, for whatever reason, they found raw. They've come to raw and then they found their way with you. What would you just as a bulk? I know you don't have these stats, I'm sure, in front of you. Gosh, I would have to say um, it used to be a lot more because I think people were finding raw out of, like in the deep, dark <laughs> edges of the internet. Like, you know, it, it wasn't in the mainstream. And like now, of course, we still get that. But I think we're getting the biggest customer is what we call the raw curious customer. The person who, like this idea, this way of feeding, it clicks. It makes intuitive sense to a lot of people. If you explain it to them, if you take time to like explain to people, okay, see this bag of dry food over here packed with like, and this fresh, like they're like, and dogs, you know, have evolved, this is their evolutionary diet. Like it really makes sense to most people. Um, so I think we have, the biggest category is the raw curious customer, the per person who is like, okay, this makes sense to me. I don't really know what it means, like all, but just show me what to do. Um, but of course we still get the people that come to us and are like, you know, I've been to the vet like this many times and, you know, I've tried this steroid and this medication and nothing's working. And like, you know, they, they found us that way. Um, so we have the people that are, have like new puppies and they want to do the best for their dog. The dog is like they're new, you know, and then we have, you know, older senior dogs who are just struggling and, you know, the owner wants to try everything they can at the, you know end of their lives. And then we have this like raw curious customer who um, is, I, I think the biggest category. And they, they tend to be like, I don't wanna say customers are, some customers are easier than others, but they tend to be the easiest customer because the hardcore raw feeding uh, customer, well, we're so grateful for them and they, you know, helped bring this company into existence. They can sometimes be a little bit difficult. <laughs> Well, all the, it's the nerds, right? The yeah, the, the yeah. nerds of, of the subject, and yeah. I say that I say that affectionately. I'm one of them. Yeah, yeah. You know, but they're you know they're analyze they're they're analyzing every single thing, and yeah. you know, and they're tweaking all the time. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. And they take up a lot. Of, you know, and we're happy to to work with them, and we're very transparent, and we're always like, you know, whatever. Like, did you change the bones? Like how the bones seem a little bit more thick this time than like, and we're like, no, still grinding them the same way. But, you know, and I think it's cool. I honestly, I think that the type of person that feeds raw, the, the type of pet parent that feeds raw, they're some of the best pet parents out there, right? Yeah. <laughs> because they care and they're, they want to do more for their dogs. They're feeding pets like family members and they want their dogs to thrive and not just survive. So, I really love this job because, you know, I feel like I'm among my people. It's like, <laughs> like everyone, you know, I can talk to people like you and like our whole team at Leafy Raw, we're all dog lovers. The customers are dog lovers. It's, it's like really an awesome, positive uh, environment. It's yeah, a great I mean, place to be in. Yeah, we're, we're just wondering. Um, sorry, Rob. I'm just saying we're in service to dogs. It's, uh, yeah. it's the most amazing. It's hard work, but it's the most amazing you know, customer you can ask for, I think. Yes, yes, yes for sure. And, and I'm wondering, um, do you have any handle on, uh, people start off maybe 25% raw, the rest kibble. Mm -hmm. Do you see them switching over time to more and more raw? So, you know, we're still gathering data on this because this is a 
relatively new um, change in our business. We used to only, so we create meal plans for dogs and we offer seven, seven different recipes, chicken, duck, venison, lamb, beef. Am I missing one? I feel like I'm missing one. Turkey. Um, and so people can choose whatever recipes they want, um, the variety that they want. Um, and so we have just, right now I can say that the people that the biggest category is most people are feeding 100% raw on our site that order from our site. The second biggest category is 50% raw. So it might just be like, because it's mathematically that's easier to figure out, like 25% raw, it's kind of like, well, what does that mean in a bowl? So it's like, you know, you can feed like 100% raw or half raw, but um, I don't know, I can't answer yet, Dr. Billinghurst, if those people that are choosing 25% are um, overall then deciding to switch to a larger percentage of raw. Like we just don't have that data yet from our own customers. Um, we're hoping that would be the case, right? Like you start to see that this is um, really benefiting your dog and it's like, you know, a gateway to the, but I just don't have that data yet from our own customers. Do you, do you get any um, feedback from veterinarians, either positive or negative, about your product and the results of animals that are eating it? Uh, well, is there any more incendiary topic than raw and vets? Right? And I feel like I've been talking. So I, I do want to say that we are not anti-vet. We, we, I do believe that vets want the best for our dogs and our pets. Absolutely, they do. Yep. There's no, like, you know, you know, you see all these things on social media that they're, you know, trying to make dogs sick so that they can make a profit. Like, it, I, we don't believe in any of that. I just think that the system is what's flawed and, and, and the way in which they were educated about nutrition, not anything out, you know, they yes, that's right. vets, but like the nutrition portion of it is flawed, right? They're not getting the full story there. You're, you're learning from kibble funded studies and they're just, they don't get the education about raw. So what I would say is that, um, and I think Dr. Patton, actually, you know, Dr. Richard Patton, I know you guys, he's a, you know, big animal nutritionist. Uh, recently, we, we posted a quote from him and it was, I'll paraphrase, but, you know, he said, clinicians who are pushing raw as dangerous and kibble as the only safe option are outdated and ill-informed and working with, you know, biased information. And I think that's, a, and it, it, that posted so well because it's just really, it's true. It's, it's, we, and we, we work with conventional vets. We work with, you know, holistic vets, obviously more holistic vets are pro raw, but the tide is slightly changing. We are seeing, you know, vets not necessarily being pro raw or like recommending it, but not, you know, chastising their clients when they see them feeding raw, which, you know, five or eight years ago, that's what would happen a lot. Um, I think that there's a softening, um, you know, in, in Dr. Karen Becker and Rodney Habib's book, The Forever Dog, she says it well, I think like, if, if vets don't start to adjust their way of thinking to meet what their clients want, it's going to hurt their business. I mean, there has to be, the consumers are driving this trend. Pet parents, like the train has left the station. Raw is here to stay, it's gaining momentum. People are seeing it with their own eyes. Like, so I think that there, there, you know, there will be a change. I don't think it's going to be fast coming from like necessarily the conventional vet community. There's a lot of work being done <laughs> to, I think, you know, fear, put, place fear in people's minds about raw. But um, I think that we could, I, I just wish that we could work better. I think that the raw companies want to work with the vets. Um, yes. The vets might be, there's some that are great, again, that are open-minded and saying, like, we have clients that come to us and say, listen, my vet has said to me, like, I just don't know about raw enough. I'm not saying don't do it, but here's the thing that I would ask, like, is it complete and balanced? Do they have a nutritionist on staff? Um, does it meet AFCO standards? And like, that's great to me. because it's like, okay, so at least the, the vet is saying, go back to the company and ask them these things. And if they meet them, then like, we can work with you. But to, to, to just turn them away completely and tell them all raw is bad. I think it's really unfair to the client. They're not giving their client the, you know, fair information. So that's my opinion. Well, you know, this is, this is exactly how I 
you know, I learned about raw. I mean, my idea of health was very different when I got my first puppy. He had really severe issues, uh, itching, horrible, severe issues. And I went to four vets and at the fourth vet literally told me, I mean, this is like an 11 week old puppy yeah. that he'd have to be on steroids the rest of his life. Now, I didn't know anything at the time really about steroids or drugs or any of that, but I knew intuitively that wasn't the answer. So it sought, I sought um, out other options. You know, yeah. that vet threw me right into the arms of Ian, <laughs> you know? And so, um, and, and that whole world was opened up to me. All of my friends thought I was crazy, mm -hmm. you know, throwing a carcass on the floor that it would, you know, he'd take out of the bowl and he'd fling around and there's, you know, yeah. you know, all that stuff. I mean, whole half, you know, well, it's quarter and then half turkey carcasses I was giving them often. But the other thing too is like, you know, we can teach our veterinarians, you know, we, I, I still do this. Um, yeah. You know, I, I recently, I had a senior dog and I was giving him, um, uh, IV pushes of glutathione and Myers cocktail and all these great nutrients. And it just, I was going, you know, too far to drive to do this uh, on a regular basis. So I sought out a right around the corner of vet for me. And I said, Hey, you know, would you be open to doing this? She had no idea how to do it. And I said, look, this would be great to, mm -hmm. to do for your clients. Let me plug you. And my, my other vet no knew what I was, you know, it, it's, it was inconvenient to keep, going there and doing this and you know there was a port i had to put in them and you know just practically speaking it was better if i did it around the corner so my vet taught the other vet and yeah. shared the suppliers and yeah. it's just you know bring people together and have them open up a conversation and i said look not only would you do some real good for these clients that need it you'll also have another revenue stream it's another reason for yeah. your clients to come into your office it yeah. makes complete sense so we can be a bridge, you know, customers can be yeah. a bridge uh, to the veterinary industry. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and I think the more that, you know, clients show up with their healthy dogs that are thriving on this food and not dying a horrible death of like, stomach, you know, whatever their the vets are taught that it's going to happen to the dogs. I think that that will help. I mean, I remember I had an English bulldog for, she lived until she was 12 years old, which is very long for an English bulldog. I mean, their life expectancy is like eight. She ate raw her entire life. Um, when I would first bring her to the vet, they were horrified that she was eating raw. And well, is it just raw hamburger meat from the grocery store? Like there was just like no knowledge of even what. Um, and then over the years, I mean, she, they would literally say, this is the healthiest bulldog we have ever seen. She didn't have any of the breed specific conditions. She had no allergies. She was a perfect weight. She was active. It's like, I mean, amazing. There has to be something happening that like, okay. <laughs> um, yep. So yeah, I mean, I, again, I think that we can work together with vets. There's amazing vets out there. I just, and I understand that, you know, they do see the other side of it. They see people coming in with like, that are just feeding ground hamburger meat, right? Like they see the, the bad side <laughs> to raw. Um, yep. So I do, we have to sort of give them credit there, but I, I do think that if they could be more open-minded, that would help a lot. Um, and I do think that we're seeing, I'm seeing that from what our clients are telling us when they go to their own vets, I'm seeing that more happen. So. It's definitely a long way away, but it's it's happening. Well, That's, that is great. It really is. I'm I'm listening to your talk because it's really important what you're saying here. That um, people who feed raw, who have healthy dogs, they need to be encouraged to go to their vets yeah. and have regular checkups. Actually, spend the money which they're going to spend now to help educate vets. Because the other thing we need to do is get a database of normal parameters, blood parameters mm -hmm. for raw fed dogs because it's different to kibble fed dogs. Yes. And we actually, this needs to become part of the veterinary mind that this is different, that yes. they do have different blood parameters yes. um, and let them correlate those blood parameters with the health of these dogs. Yes. 
yeah. instead of correlating with sickness all the time yeah. and let them correlate raw with health, we will change them very gradually. And this was one of the earliest things I said to people in my lectures. Please continue to go to your vets so that we can educate them. And so what you're talking about there is a really important thing. Yeah. So as you talk to your customers, yeah. encourage them to do that. And it's important anyway to have a database for your dog, yeah. a starting point of those blood parameters. Yeah. So if there are any changes, yeah. they can be monitored. So yeah. all of that's important that we keep we keep in with our vets, we educate our vets, but we also do the right thing by our dog by keeping a chart of what's happening in their bodies. All mm -hmm. important. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Have that baseline of, of their yes. health is really important. Real quick, I'll just mention uh, Amy was... Uh, kind enough to set up a discount code for anybody who sees this and wants to just start um, on at we, we feed raw on their first order 20% off we don't get paid a, a single dime we just made it an easy discount code for you Gussie 20 yep. when you check out and so thank you for that Amy it's very nice for people who are watching this and um, and I want to get to a question which is a really good one it, it's a little bit off of this topic of um, that we're just going into, which was, uh, you know, the days when I remember back when I started raw, where they would tell you that never start a sick dog on raw ever. Mm -hmm. And the fear was, you know, this is too much to handle this, you know, and it was back in that, you know, that idea that, that there was too much to deal with, or there could be bacteria. It was all that fear around it. And so it's nice to see people on, I mean, I, I'm in a plenty of groups on Facebook, for example, and you see people that are, that, you know, they have, it sparked their interest that their dogs, they don't know where to turn, their dogs aren't well, and so they're going into raw and things are turning around for them. But this is, um, this, uh, Ian, you'll notice is we're in this, the, this somewhat new field of fermented, I'm going to field this question to you, uh, Ian. Uh, from Leroy Brown. Leroy, I remember from last I, or, or two live streams ago, Leroy is the name of the dog. So hi, Leroy. That's the picture of Leroy, I think. Um, uh, so thank you, Leroy Brown, for asking the question. Um, I have read recently that fermented foods should only be given to healthy dogs, and even then, it should be done carefully. Fermented foods feed yeast, question mark, and histamines that can cause issues. So uh, I have a little reply, but I'm going to let you take that first question, um, Ian. Well, with anything new, it's always, particularly something like fermented foods, it's probably a very good idea to start small. And we do know that um, immune compromised animals that are given overwhelming levels of fermented foods are very rich in high levels of probiotics can actually develop infections. And so that's no surprise because we're overwhelming them with a bacteria that the body is not used to. So the answer is start small. And yes, um, they can produce histamines, but when fed in the context of a raw diet and a properly balanced raw diet, those histamines are generally dealt with. That's not a problem unless you have an animal that is specifically histamine sensitive. So I hand it back to you, Rob. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and you know, our, we always start, uh, a conversation like this by saying that you know always look to your vet and if you have if you have a relationship with a holistic vet fantastic bring them into the conversation uh, don't go it alone if you have a dog that isn't well whatever that may be um, consult that veterinarian um, we I think the the amounts we're talking about are um, small and they're additive what they're designed to be we don't we don't want you to feed, you know, um, uh, cups of our fermented powder because it's so concentrated. We're talking teaspoons. So, you know, we talk about a teaspoon serving for every 10 to 20 pounds. And thank you, Amy, for being so patient with this question. I just wanted to. No, I, I, this. Exactly. Um, and so um, what we're talking about is it being additive and these are easier vegetables to digest actually because they've been fermented and the microbes in them um you know even the best microbes even the best probiotics that you give um if you give them to the wrong animal uh, that's really sick or not able to deal with them you're going to have some 
symptoms, whether they be a histamine effect or, you know, a diarrhea effect. Um, we don't see it yet. Uh, we haven't received any of those uh, questions or issues. I think the people coming to us are um, not having to deal with those issues yet, but it's a great question. It's a question I really wanted to address, so I'm so glad that you asked it. Um, I would just say it's very simple. If you have a very, very sick dog, please work with your veterinarian very closely. Bring them our package, bring them our label, show them your phone with <clears throat> our ingredients. And, um, you know, if they say, great, introduce it slowly, fantastic. And if they say don't, then this might not be for you right now. You know, maybe another diet is. So I think that's it. Um, I, think, I, think we, uh, I think we addressed it. Um, we're getting a lot of other questions, uh, Amy. No, sorry, a lot of other comments that um, I'm not going to put up on the screen. But people are, you know, uh, I know these are people that aren't your people because I've seen them on many of our live streams. Um, you know, they're just like, you know, uh, you are correct, Amy. Good, you know, uh, great. Um, yeah, great comments. Uh, some some raw feeding is made too difficult at times. Um, here's, a, here's a quick question for you. Do you have any um, tips? Here we go from Tina Austin. Mm -hmm. Any tips for a small dog that does not like raw food? I love this question. Thanks, Tina. Um, it's so funny, the small dog, big dog thing, because we always, We've had to do a lot of education with our customers too. Like, well, can my can my chihuahua eat this too? And can like, you know, we really wanted to start changing our advertising to show more of these small dogs because small dogs can thrive on raw food just like big dogs can too. Um, so I would my tips would be the same for a small dog that doesn't like raw food as it would be for a big dog that doesn't like raw food. Um, what we suggest is. Um, one of the first things we suggest is to gently sear the food. And I mean gently sear. Don't cook, but just warm it up. Because a lot of dogs, if they're used to especially eating, you know, kibble or even another, another cooked pre-made brand or home cooked, they're not used to the cold temperature. Um, and it can turn them off. So we suggest searing it or at least serving at room temperature. Um, there's also some like really tasty toppers that you can add. Um, some of the ones that we like to suggest are canned sardines um, and water. Um, pumpkin can be good. Goat milk is a great one. Um, Gussie's gut probably is another. <laughs> um, no, but you know, there's tons of enticing toppers and um, Another thing that I think is really important is a little bit of tough love. And this is the hardest step for a lot of pet parents to take uh, because, you know, dogs will not starve themselves if you provide them with food. They won't. It's not like cats. You have to be a little bit more careful. But with dogs, it, you have to remember that you're not depriving them of food. You're providing them with food and they're denying the food that you're offering them. So we found, uh, this is funny, we have a new... Um, a new employee at Leafy Raw who just started in our tech department and he just started feeding his dog raw. His dog was on kibble before and he presented the raw to his dog and the dog was like, no, I don't know what this is. Like was, you know, I'm a food strike and he's like, gosh, this sucks. Like, <laughs> but he's, he stayed strong. And after I think a few days, the dog started eating and now his dog absolutely loves it and like whines at mealtime and I can't get enough of it. So the, the tough love approach is really um, helpful. I don't, I know that there's, and I would defer to you, Dr. Billinghurst, on like smaller dogs, like if there's any sort of like, you have to be a little bit more careful with how long they go on food strike. But um, I think if what we say is put the food down um, and walk away. Don't hover, act concerned. The dog will, you know, notice these behaviors and be like, what, it, you know, feel suspicious. Um, and if they don't eat it after 15 minutes, pick it up and put it away and then try again at next meal time. And then keep mm -hmm. doing that until they're hungry enough to eat it. That's the key. With everything else you do, two simple words, hunger helps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Most important. Um, yeah. And the Sierra's mix it with something they absolutely love, but combine it fairly closely, all those things that you've mentioned. Um, they will eat it. Yeah. Just yeah. Eat it. The other one, of course, is the word patience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to be patient. The other thing that you actually believe it's important. You Until brought up a really important. good point of temperature and in oh, temperature. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like 
you know, I think I learned that from you, Ian. Uh, I mean, it just from the beginning, I remember I would set my meat out a little bit. Just, you know, I'd go for a walk with him, I my dog, I'd come back and it was, you know, more room temperature. But you can also just boil if you if you're in a pinch, I've been in that that position too. Just boil some water if you want, throw it in the in the cold and mix it up a little bit. You're not really cooking it. You're not yeah. even blanching it. You're yeah. you're just bringing it up in temperature, and and it's yeah. the texture change that they like too. Yes, 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 exactly. And some of they sometimes like it cold. Yes, and sometimes they like it cold. I know it's so it's really the individual dog, but you know it really comes down to the owner being willing to try some different things, have patience and persistence, and know that you're not starving your dog. It's hard. It's like, oh my gosh, my dog's not eating. It's been, um, I think, uh, who. Amy Marshall, who has that um, great blog, Primal Pooch, she writes about this on her blog, and she said that she, I think she had a dog that she knows about that went 10 days. <laughs> That's the longest that she knows. Wow. And finally, you like, gave in. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, I, I think it if, if you can stick it out and it can be tough, um, they will eat it. And I will, most of the time, end up loving it and thriving on it. So, yeah. Let me say this too, Amy. Um if you have a small dog who's been on uh, kibble, so they're going to be very sugar sensitive. Uh, they've had a lot of sugar all their life, so that they're continually raising their insulin. So they they really then get hypoglycemic. Mm. Start off with some cooked meat. Just cook it. They will eat that. Yeah. Increase your cooked meat because then you're decreasing the sugar in the diet, and it can it can just be straight cooked meat for a little while. Yeah. They'd gradually cook it less. Now yeah. you're actually tuning the body to not produce these sugar surges. Sure. Mm -hmm. So it, this is another thing that you have to remember. These meals don't have to be always this complete and balanced diet. And certainly when you're transitioning, right. that's, right. A, that's a really healthy way to go. So just have to be creative, understand yeah. a little bit of physiology, particularly the sugar and insulin thing, which are the two things that are actually killing our dogs sugar and insulin between them, but both of them, the insulin and the sugar, between them produce uh, these uh, end, these glycated end products and also uh, inflammation in the body. And they're the, they're the things that are, well, they're major. Well, not, not the only thing, but very major. But, yeah, just get them to eat raw. <laughs> and whatever you could do, whether it's hunger, you must use your patience. For Over the years, I've noticed that people who said, my dogs won't eat raw, they just won't, then their dog gets sick, and then suddenly they learn that this might be helped by raw, and very suddenly their dogs will eat raw. <laughs> they were prepared to have a little bit of patience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we uh, we have a hard stop time uh, for Ian today, but yeah. Amy, this has been a really yeah. fun episode and you know opportunity to get to talk to you. Yeah, it's been really great. Thank you guys so much for having me, and yeah, it's been it's been awesome. Well, thank you for sharing your experiences. Those are the best. They are gems because that's real life. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, thank and thank you for being, you know, a part of um, the whole food movement because this, the problems we have with our dogs are this pretty much the same problems we have with people yeah. and their health issues and their food and their diet. But making, you know, uh, you know being a part of, you know, we, we, we break it down into paleo and raw and all that, but it's really just good quality, whole food, real food. Yeah. And, um, you know, and for those people who want to make it on their own, wonderful. And for yeah. those people that want to have it um, done for them and, you know, take, I know a lot of people who do not want to handle meat. Yeah. They want to open a package, scrape it out with a spoon and, you know, yeah. they're making a face the whole time. <laughs> But they know this is what I know a lot of uh, vegans that do oh, this. Oh, we have a ton of vegan and vegetarian clients. Yep. You know, and so they don't want to deal with me. And, you know, bless their hearts, they're doing it for their dogs. So thank yeah. you for making it easy for those folks. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's good to, you know, every day I'm inspired by my sister, you know, her dedication to, you know, animals. And it makes me want to make this company the best it can be. And I'm also inspired by, you know, the whole raw feeding movement. I mean, these, it's an awesome movement. People are just really courageous and, you know, go doing what they know is right for dogs. Um, even when a lot of the mainstream is sometimes saying something else. So, 
Yeah, you have to stick together. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, have a great day, everybody. Thank that's you for right. joining us so much on the uh, on the live stream today, and have a great day. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.